just like to welcome everyone who will be listening to this sermon on the internet as well. And um, so the, uh, the sermon title today is A Mystery Hidden for Ages, Now Revealed to God's Church. And the scripture reading will be from Colossians 1, 15 to 28. And the scripture reading will be done by uh, uh, Mrs. Gillian Elliott. Uh, I think I'm alive now. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes. We he just see the top of your head, though. <laughs> okay. But then I can read the, the scripture easier because it's... Okay. Anyway. Sure. Okay, good. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who, were, who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. These inspired words show us the preeminence and the greatness of Jesus. Thank you, God, for showing us how your eternal son, Jesus, is worthy of adoration. He is the one we proclaim. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, so in the scripture that we've just read, God is revealing to us the preeminence of Jesus and how he is central not only for human beings and the church, but actually for the whole of creation. So in our focus on these inspired scriptures today, I hope that all of us will realize more profoundly how Jesus is worthy of adoration and worship and how we can grow and trust in him uh, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of who he is. We be, he, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. So I'll just read a few scriptures that explains that a little bit. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He is the irradiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature as we find in Hebrews 1.3. So we, we might ask, well, God is invisible. So how can we have an image? How can Jesus be an image of God? Well, because in Greek philosophy as, uh, as uh, Garland, uh, as David Garland writes in his commentary on Colossians, the, in the application commentary, 
the image has a share in the reality that is revealed and may be said to be the reality. So an image was not considered something distinct from the object it represented uh, like a reproduction as the image of God Christ is an exact and as well as a visible representation of God. So it means that Jesus is an exact representation of God. Why? Because he is God in the flesh. And he is the, the firstborn of all creation. And you know, there are some that believe that Jesus was, creation, was created because it says that he is the, the firstborn of all creation. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, <clears throat> firstborn may, re may refer, of course, to the first child, but is, it can also be used as a metaphor to refer to sovereignty. Uh, and we read that in, in, in Psalm 89, 27, for example, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So it refers to, it's a metaphor to refer to greatness, to refer to sovereignty. And, and this title, the firstborn here, is referring to the preeminence of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ uh, is before all created things as we shall see in some of subsequent verses. And Jillian, Mrs. Elliot has just read that, that for in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. So as we come to know Jesus, it's important to appreciate how he reveals himself to us. You know, oftentimes we see Jesus as man when he and what he became at the incarnation. But we can for easily forget that he is God, the creator of everything. And when we say when the Bible says everything, it means everything. He's the creator of everything. And he's created what we see and what we don't see, whether big or small. He's created all life. He's created the life of angels, the life of animals, of birds, of insects. And he has created human beings in his image. He has created the stars, the galaxies, the atoms, the neutrons, the nuclei. And there's nothing he has not created except for evil. God did not create evil because there is no evil in God. So when we look at nature, we see the glory of God. We now see some of the vastness of the universe through the James Webb Space Telescope, which was launched in space on December 25, uh, 2001, 2021. And because of the science of man, man can see things in the universe, in the greatness of the universe that were never seen before. And it's a revelation of the greatness of God, the greatness of Jesus Christ, who created and sustains all these things. Um, so how big and large is the universe? And I think it, when we think of these things, it helps us to appreciate the greatness of our God, the greatness of Jesus Christ the eternal son of God, the father, part of the Trinity, who was a member of the Trinity, the one God. And uh, the, unit, the, the universe, they say, because of the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, is the equivalent of nine trillion kilometers or six trillion miles. And our universe is 93 billion light years in diameter. So when I read that, if you're like me, it just blows the, just blows my mind. I, I cannot fathom how big our universe is. But in 93 billion years, the width of it in diameter is just the observable universe. 
the universe which we can currently see because the James Webb telescope does not see the whole universe. The whole universe, scientists say, might very well be 250 times larger than the observable universe, or at least 7 trillion light years in diameter. So why is the universe so big? <laughs> well, the universe is so big because it's constantly expanding. And it does so at a speed that even exceeds the, the speed of light. Who can imagine that? And space itself is actually growing. And that is going, that has been going on for around 4 billion years or so, the, the, uh, the scientists tell us. And this is from, taken from nineplanets.org. But just to give you an idea, and I know we can't figure that out in our minds, at least I can't. <laughs> 93 billion light years is about 900 billion trillion kilometers. 93 billion, the diameter of the universe that we now see is about 900 billion trillion kilometers. That is a nine with 23 zeros afterwards. And we have to, as we read these scriptures, we have to to realize that the one who sustains all of this is Jesus Christ. That's the role that he's been given by God the Father. And when everything, when all evil is gone, as 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, he'll return everything to God the Father in perfection. And, and the problem is that with us human beings, when God, when we when we are blinded by the God of this world we can easily make this whole universe and see it as a God that, who, that gives life. And many of the religions of this world actually see the universe as gods, as a God. And so Paul writes in Romans, when we put God out of the equation of creation, Paul writes, their foolish hearts have been, were darkened. And that's why man makes creation a god. And, uh, and there's very popular books written on what the, the universe can give us and all of that as we throw our thoughts into it and it comes back and all of that. Just deny anything to deny God because... To know who God is, our minds has to be opened by the Holy Spirit. And again, the Bible tells us clearly that Jesus is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. And because all things hold together in Christ does not mean that creation is a part, it is, is in is equal to Jesus. You know, Jesus is before all things and he's created creation and God created out of creation, created all of the universe out of love, not because he needed to, but because he wanted to share his love with human beings. So the universe is separated, is separate from Jesus Christ, is separate from God. And that is important to, to realize as well. So nothing or nobody can exist apart from God, apart from Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the perfect revelation of who God is. That is why it is said that he is the perfect image of God. And Jesus, as we come to know him, is awesome and because he is the second person of, of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as we read these scriptures in Colossians, as we approach them with a childlike attitude, and we read these inspired words for what they say, it is very clear that it points to the greatness of Jesus Christ.
we have to acknowledge that there are many, many things that we do not understand. God in Jesus Christ has revealed to us what salvation is. And we see to a, 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 a glass darkly as the Bible tells us. And realizing the splendor, the majesty and the glory of Jesus makes us appreciate all the more the gift of the father to us when he sent his son to become one of us in our flesh, incarnate in our flesh. And realizing his greatness helps us to be in awe, adoration and worship of Jesus because this great God, Jesus has made himself nothing he set aside his divinity and his glory to become one of us. And he's a gift of God the Father. He's a gift to us. And for Jesus to voluntarily make himself a human being, well, come, come, uh, sh what I should say is when Jesus became incarnate and adopted our human nature, this was an act of humility, of humility, which is difficult to imagine. But it's and that it shows the love of God for humanity, because the Apostle John says, "God so loved the world that He sent His His one and eternal Son to us." When we pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, do we realize the awesomeness of the throne we are approaching? Do we realize in whose presence we come to in, with boldness and assurance? That because of our high priest, Jesus Christ, we can, we can come in the presence of God himself. You know, Jesus, when he ascended to heaven, is not, he's sitting on the throne with his father. Because he is both God and man. We approach greatness every time we pray. And it says in 118 that he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might have be preeminent. So the, the apostle Paul wrote about creation. Now he writes about the church. And you will notice in this passage that the focus is on Jesus Christ. There are other passages in the Bible which speaks of the church and they speak of the relationship that we have with one another as member of his body united to Christ. But this scripture focuses on the preeminence of Jesus Christ. So he is the head of the body, the church, again, follows after the, the statement that he is the creator of everything. So the church and creation are linked together because of Jesus Christ, who holds all of us together, who holds everything together. Now, we don't know the exact date when Jesus created the universe. But we do know when the church was created. It was given birth on the day of Pentecost after Jesus sent it to heaven. And when the Holy Spirit was first sent by God the Father through Jesus Christ to the church, to the apostles. And, and Jesus being the head of the body means that he is the one who directs the church and who gives it life. The church exists because of Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ. And being the head, being Lord, Jesus is the one who directs the actions of the church. He is the one who adds to the church by the Holy Spirit. 
He is the one who brings us into relationship with one another because we are members of his body. So the whole of creation and his new creation, which is the church, are of what most important to Jesus, are of what most important to God. And we are the humble embodiment of Jesus on the earth as he abides in us and we abide in him. We are members of his body, the apostle Paul writes elsewhere. And apart from Jesus, who gives us life, who gives us purpose, who gives purpose to the church, the church cannot do anything. But we are called for a purpose. We are called to live for him, to live holy lives, because he has made us holy. And we are to proclaim the good news of the gospel to the world, making disciples as Jesus asked to the church. And we are to proclaim his greatness, as 1 Peter 2.9 tells us. And Jesus is the beginning of the church. Humbling himself to become one of us and to live a perfect life in our corrupted flesh, being without sin and having no reason to experience death, he submitted himself to the consequence of sin and he died. His great God, the creator of everything, accepted to come to live as a human being and being perfect having lived perfectly in our broken bodies, in our broken flesh, in our sinful flesh, without ever sinning, he died for us. Because being our creator, he acted as the federal head of all humanity, representing all of us. And he defeated both physical and spiritual eternal death. You know, in the fullness of the kingdom of God, there will be no more physical death. There will be no more eternal death because Jesus has changed absolutely everything. And because death could not hold him down, we are united with him through faith and we receive eternal life because we have become his temple as we read in 1 Corinthians 6. One day, Every human being will be resurrected and appear before Jesus for judgment. And when we stop and think of it, you know, the future of humanity is dependent on Jesus. No one, the world does not know this, but if it was not for Jesus, we would all stand the ground. There would be no future. Jesus is, our, is the future, is the hope and the future of the world. And he's revealed that to his church. And at the resurrection, whether we receive eternal life or not, for those who do not know Jesus, will be based on whether we accept Jesus or not. And when he, when we, when he reveals himself, and God will make provision for everyone to come to faith. We don't know exactly how he's going to work that out. But we know that's, that's how, that's what the Bible tells us. And Jesus, we have to re remember, took our corrupted human nature. He defeated all evil existing outside, such as, you know, he defeated the devil. Uh, he defeated death. And he also defeated the evil that exists in man. He defeated evil in himself because he had our corrupted human bodies, our human flesh. And he did not create us to be thrown away. We know that he had our corrupted human nature because he was tempted in everything just like as we are, as we read in Hebrews 2, 18 and Hebrews 4, 15. God, the Father, cannot be tempted. God cannot be tempted. And Jesus was tempted. 
And we cannot break away from sin on our own. We, as human beings, we are, have a tendency to be self-centered, to live as if God does not exist. That is the way of the world. And we cannot break out of that. But Jesus lived a perfect life for us, always doing the Father's will in our corrupted human nature. And he, he, when he died on the cross, nature, human nature was changed in Jesus Christ. And when we are connected to him, he gives us this new life, this, his righteousness. Because sin is not simply an attitude, is not simply attitude, it's an act. And the fact of our sinful acts is an objective barrier between us and God. It is that which we have done and which we can which cannot be undone that stands between us and God. Sin is attitude and disposition. Sin is a condition of sinfulness. Sin is a power that enslaves us, and sin has brought death as as uh, Thomas Noble writes in The Theology of Christian Perfecting. So sin is in us. Sin brings death. And only Jesus was able to, to break that, making himself and living our life from his birth to his death. Sin is living independently from God. It's living life, making our own rules and devising our own values apart from Jesus. It's thinking we can distinguish between right and wrong without being anchored in Christ. And again, Jesus living in our flesh never lived independently from God the Father. That is why, that is the reason that he is the firstborn of the dead. Because it points to the fact that Jesus has preeminence over absolutely everything. It means that death and evil, whether it exists outside of us, in place, like in the, the devil is, is the personification of all evil, and inside us. Evil has no future. Sin has no future. Death has no future. This is our hope in Jesus Christ. And in verse 19, it says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace, peace, peace by his blood on his, on, on his cross. Again, these scriptures, they're so rich, it's difficult to capture all of them. But the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus Christ. In, in, in the Old Testament, God dwelled in the temple. He dwelled in the Holy of Holies. But his wholeness dwells in Jesus Christ when he the wholeness of God dealt, dwelt in Jesus Christ when he came to the earth. And that's why he could reveal who God the Father is. Because he came from God. And although humanity did not recognize him, it's very clear that he says that he only knows the Father and the Father knows Jesus. And Jesus makes God known to whom he wills. And his desire is that everyone will know him because he says that he will draw every man to himself in John 12. So, so making peace by his blood on the cross, that is a powerful statement. Jesus came into this world unnoticed and unrecognized. He came as a humble human baby to an unknown, unwed mother and stepfather. And while he was hanging on the cross, it was not seen as the great event that it was. He was mocked. He was corn. He was ridiculed. He descended into the depravity of humanity and the pit of sin. 
And he did it to pay the penalty of sin that we could never pay for ourselves because we were dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses. We could not reconcile ourselves to God. We cannot give ourselves life. It has to be a gift from God. And the cross shows us that although the world is corrupt, disharmonious, conflicted, and disordered, God loves humanity in spite of our brokenness and our sinfulness. He doesn't want us to stay that way. And he's come to change that in Jesus Christ. And sin, as we know, brought violence to the world. Death entered the world in a very, very violent way when Cain, when Cain killed Abel out of jealousy and hostility. And this hostility continues. Man is an enemy of man, as we see in wars and all drug drugs dealers and everything else. With our estrangements, so God submitted himself, Jesus submitted himself to this deadly violence and rejection by human beings. And he reconciled the whole world to himself. The Father reconciled the whole world to himself in Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5. He came to give his life for a ransom for all in 1 Timothy 2.6. No one is excluded. And he accepted to be physically destroyed at the hands of men. And blood refers to death by violence. Jesus shed every blood, drop of his blood in his body. And the cross typifies shame, a brutal and dehumanizing instrument of death. And humanity, because of Jesus Christ, because of what the Father did to Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, is no longer estranged from God. Because God has made provision for everyone to come to him when he awakens our minds to know these great truths. And he says, and you who were once alienated and hostile in man doing evil things, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you've heard which he has been proclaimed, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, am a minister. And I, I just like to focus on the warning in, in this verse because of lack of time here. But we realize that there's a warning here because relationship always goes, always go two ways. God is always faithful. But our response to God is to continue in faith. We need to continue to be in relationship with him as, as we read here. Indeed, if you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast. Now, what happens is that we are saved by grace. We cannot, everything, the work of, of rec reconciliation has been finished at the cross when Jesus died. We have to participate in that grace when we accept it. And a relationship is always a day-to-day -day effort, isn't it? It's need, it needs to be nourished. God will never force his relationship on us. He leads us, but he doesn't force us. And the message of, of Jesus to the seven churches is certainly an example of that. And give David Garland, in his commentary on Colossians expresses, well, expresses it well. He says, the theme of human rebellion and sin is an unbroken scarlet thread that runs through the entire Bible to the foot of the cross. There it has been severed. Paul proclaims in the opening words of Colossians that Christ has brought hope to a desperate situation rescue from darkness and the forgiveness of sins which separates us from god and from one another our response in faith to what christ has done grounds us firm, firmly in god's grand purpose to remake us into what we were intended to be 
holy and blameless. Paul's statement in uh, Colossians 1.23 also contains a warning. If you continue in your faith, if you understand that through Christ we gain a new relationship with God, we also recognize that relationship can never remain static. It either, it, they either grow or die. We enter a new relationship when we marry. Most of us have experienced marriage and understand that a successful marriage takes work. We may remain in the state of marriage, but the relationship can die if we do not work at it. The same is true of our relationship with God. If we neglect or flirt with other attraction, we endanger it. So this is a warning. And Paul gave this warning in hope, just like the author of the Hebrews. He said in, in verse 38 of Hebrews 10, but my righteousness shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him, God says. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and preserve their soul. And we realize that in marriage, we need to take time for one another. We spend time with one another. We talk with one another. We listen to one another. We go through problems of life with one another. We are committed to one another. And the same is true of our relationship with God. We need to, we need to spend time with God. We need to spend time in prayer. We need to spend time in Bible study. We need to spend time in meditation and and all the other disciplines. And we need to submit to his will in all areas of our life. And we we are it to maintain that relationship. And uh, we are not to take it lightly, God tells us. And then he comes, Paul describes himself as a, in verse 24 to 28, as a minister, he became a minister according to the stewardship from God to make the word of God fully known in verse 25. The mystery hidden for ages and generation now reveals to his saint, now revealed to his saints, to them, to us who are believers, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of the mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim. Jesus is the center of the message of the gospel, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we are, God has called us to participate in the relationship, the eternal relationship of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through the man Jesus. We will never become man, we will never become God, but we will become and be transformed like the man Jesus, who is both God and man, and we will share, he will, he will make us to share in his glory and in this relationship, the eternal relationship of love of God the Father. We will not experience, of course, this relationship, this full relationship uh, until the return of Jesus Christ and at the resurrection. And what is beautiful is that the church is not an exclusive club. Everyone in verse 28 is mentioned three times because the plan of God includes everyone. And the word warning there is a word that is, can be, it, it, it's in the sense of admonish, warn, counsel, exhort. And I think it, it's captured in, in the 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where he says that all scripture is breathed out of God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So that's God's plan for all of us. His desire is that we mature in Christ. That was Paul's desire because it's the desire of God. So we, so Paul preached this 
this wisdom, this pointing people to Jesus Christ. So the church is a place of validation, of encouragement, where hope in Christ is proclaimed. So it, when we stop and think, is there greater news than Christ in us, the hope of glory? With the Apostle Paul, we all believe that no better news exists than Christ in us, the hope of glory, a mystery that has been revealed to God's people.